Massachusetts, you know, their, your windshield after even an hour of driving would be filled. I'm just looking at this little cartoon on the upper right with insects. And now I know that I can drive from here to Ohio and have two insects on my windshield. So I'm just, you know, we all have experienced a massive decline in insects. And the problem with that is uh, that that's the core and the base of the food chain. You know, songbirds rely on it. Songbirds have dropped 30%. I mean, not only because of insects, but also habitat loss and pesticide use and lots of other issues. Everyone knows monarchs are down 90%. There was a um, Chicago used to be home to uh, the rusty patch bumblebee, it still is, but they have declined an estimated 87%. I've never seen a rusty patch bumblebee in, in Chicago and, and I've been here for 20 years and it uh, was once very common here. We're gonna share out this uh, slide deck. So honestly, I'm not gonna go through all the the global validation of, of all these um, you know, losses. That little bug in the lower right is a mayfly, just in case we don't recognize mayflies. New York Times ran an article about the loss of insects. And one uh, short comment that really struck home to me was the deeper worry is that a whole insect world might be quietly going missing. You know, it's we, we there's certain charismatic uh, megafauna like like uh, fireflies and monarchs, but there are just so many insects out there that are declining that uh, we we really have to stop and figure out how we can change um, things to the extent we can. So one of the questions is how much space do we need? I saw that there were a lot of people who are thinking about on our poll uh, planting in the ground, but you can actually plant in containers. Uh, the bigger, the better for containers. And we're gonna talk about that. But even if you have an herb garden, you know, you can add an, um, a coneflower or something like that to an herb garden and just try to create a little bit more habitat on your uh, balcony. Um, adding a puddling space. A puddling space is just a, a shallow dish where butterflies can come. And uh, normally it has some, it's basically a mud bath. It has some minerals in it and maybe some rotting fruit, which uh, they like. Um, I'll talk to more about more of the details of this, uh, but this is a neighbor of mine um, who converted her parkway to a shade garden and a natural habitat shade garden. And, um, you know, lawns, by contrast, lawns, uh, basically, there are very few things that eat lawns. Everyone is, uh, gets upset about grubs under, uh, under the lawn, you know, eating up their roots. But there are very few things besides that that eat our lawn. We shave off any um, seeds or blooms that might feed insects. And uh, lawns are not generally non-native. Uh, and they displace native plants. So um, this is one example. Uh, this is Nancy's front yard actually too. It was Pachysandra in the upper left is what it looked like. And now the photos on the right show what it looks like. This is another person on our call here is uh, Mary Jane Klein. She kindly shared some of her photos, just demonstrating what a native, native plants in your, in your front garden can look like. So some landscaping tips just uh, to get start us off here, you know, pollinators need host plants and nectar plants. We want to encourage people to plant natives, not cultivars. I'm going to talk more about that. Cultivars aren't necessarily bad, but uh, there's been a long evolution between insects and plants. And uh, uh, we'll talk more about that in a minute. Um, also, mass plantings, having the same species together uh, attracts more pollinators. It also is more appealing to a uh, human eye. It looks more intentional and it looks more uh, organized to humans. So that's another way to kind of sell it to your neighbors. Uh, saving bare spots of soil helps some native bees. No insecticides and herbicides. We're not necessarily, I realize that herbicides are used in, in ecological restorations. But do we have to use them in our yards? For the most part, I think we can pull and we can uh, smother with cardboard and we'll share more about that. But there are other things to do in our yards uh, without herbicides and insecticides. Um, height toward the black, shorter in front, that's obvious. Uh, in containers, the deeper the better, at least 12 inches. R ideally, and if you wanna try to overwinter, the, the 
really it should be a three foot three foot by three foot by three foot cube or something like that. They do they sell those as uh, uh, cedar cedar boxes, but adding water to that is probably too heavy for a balcony. So I'm not saying you know uh, that you necessarily would do something like that, but deeper the better is for containers. And you can also think in terms of uh, a wall garden on a, on a balcony or something like that, that would get, allow deeper roots to, to take hold. Um, metal and plastic uh, and glazed ceramics evaporate less than um, uh, unglazed uh, pots. And uh, for overwintering, um, you, you know, you have to bring in ceramic, um, ceramic pots. So, uh, you know, wood can overwinter. Uh, there, are, there are different um, materials that overwinter better than others. Consider the weight if you're on a balcony. And it always takes more water for a container garden. I just want to flag that. You always have to be watering for container gardens. In the ground, uh, to appeal, have your garden appeal more to neighbors, uh, plant with sedge or grass on the outer edge. It also stops the plants from flopping over onto walkways and, and uh, alienating some neighbors. Planting densely, uh, so not a whole lot of space between plants, reduces weeds, gives insects uh, hiding places. Uh, you, uh, you know, natural gardens take weeding just like any other garden, so to the extent you can reduce weeds, it's worth it. Having a focus point is also visually attractive for adults, uh, adults for humans. <laughs> um, having a path or a stepping stone, a fountain, a bird bath or rocks, or even a, uh, a log or, or driftwood or something like that also makes it look more like an intentional garden if there's a focus to it. And a sign can help explain what you're doing. If, you're, if your sign mentions you know, pollinator garden in progress, that, that may help. Uh, who pollinates? I just want to flag that lots of things pollinate. This list is in order of uh, the most effective pollinators uh, to, um, to other. We don't really have uh, pollinating bats here. We have insect eating bats. So uh, these are sort of in, in order of uh, efficiency, but bees and flies actually beat out butterflies. I, I want to mention, you know, monarchs are, uh, you know, they're important and, and, you know, but they're not the you know top level pollinator here. In fact, this little minor bee in the center photograph, um, actually, the it's a non-stinging bee, and uh, they're they come out in early spring, and and they're pr pretty effective pollinators. So, mentioned. I also want to. Uh, there was a a friend of mine who's a uh, master gardener, and uh, when some milkweed bugs appeared on his milkweed, he uh, said, you know, well, we're team milkweed here, so we have to kill these bugs. And I just want to get away from the idea that we have to be team plant or even team bird or team particular species. I really hope that we can be team biodiversity, except some insect damage um, in your yard. You know, if, uh, if it turns out that something's truly dying and it's of great value to you, you know, for the most part, soapy water uh, with a little oil in it will kill anything from honeybees, desirable or not, what you spray, you can smother with uh, soapy water and a little oil in it. But for the most part, we want to raise our tolerance for a little insect damage. We need insects. Uh, so I'm not going to read through this. This is uh, about container plants. I just want to call out that there are a lot of uh, plant, uh, different species that will grow in containers. I also want to call out how uh, useful some of these plants are. You, you can see I've indicated after the, the name of the plant, like ferns, you know, what's the value of a lady fern? Well, there are insects that eat its foliage and they rely on it for their development. Um, same thing with baneberry, you know, uh, it, halfway down there, more or less, a few lines down. Uh, nectars and berries from baneberry are very important for insects and for birds. So I, a lot of these have enormous use, even if they're just in your containers. So um, yeah. There's that. And here's a little layout for a container. Uh, some of the things I have to admit that some of the things I saw online did not seem realistic to me for a container. This one did. Um, and I have at the end of this uh, presentation, lots of links that when you look at this in your, you know, if, you, if you're interested in your own time, you can see where I got these different links from. 
So here are just some species that could manage in a container. Um, in the ground, this is from the US Department of Agriculture. They have uh, lots of layouts of different uh, gardens that can go in, your, in the ground and species mentioned. Again, this is, uh, this is for full sun, but this, and, and there are in addition, I, I have in that um, little green box, there are plant search functions to find um, uh, a variety of plants. Both Audubon does that planting for birds and National Wildlife Federation will show how many caterpillars eat from particular uh, plant species. And there's also uh, two online nurseries, Prairie Moon and Prairie Nursery that allow you to search uh, all native plants by uh, height and sun needs or shade needs and uh, soil and, and all sorts of things. So there are a few search functions here for you. At Natural Habitat, we're, we're trying to make it in Evanston. I know that not all of you are in Evanston, but um, in Evanston, there is a requirement that you get permission for planting on your parkway. So we would like to make that easier. It is already actually pretty easy, but uh, we'd like to get different plans approved by the city so that we can just share them out and maybe share them out with some seeds and some plants to make it easier for people to start their own gardens and reduce the lawn on our parkways. So this is not approved yet by the city. I'm waiting to hear back. They have a new staff, um, which is great, that are uh, going to be looking at this. But um, it's just an example of, of uh, if it's not in your parkway, you could do something like this in another, you know, in a backyard or something like that. But so I mentioned at the top that uh, insects, uh, well, yes, insects need host plants as well as nectar plants. Host plants are, uh, I mentioned the, also the importance of native plants. Uh, native plants and native insects evolve together for millennia. And so what happens is uh, insects develop a special um, tolerance for uh, things that might otherwise be toxic in some of our plants, like you, pe many people know, milkweed. Milkweed has a milky uh, sap that is, uh, you know, uh, actually makes monarchs taste bad. But monarchs have developed the enzymes that help them to digest that. Well, that is true for 90% of insects. This is not an uncommon thing. It's not only true of butterflies, it's also true of a, a bunch of bees and, and um, different, different insects. So that's the real reason to uh, choose native plants. Cultivars, we can speak about that if people have questions later, but cultivars have uh, been uh, developed with humans, you know, in mind more. So they may have more petals or they maybe have foliage that's a different color. And some of that can change the chemistry of the plant so that it is no longer conserved as a host plant. So that's the issue with cultivars. It may not, it doesn't mean that 100% of cultivars are problematic but we need to focus on native plants so that we keep our own insects alive. And there, this is a uh, Chicago Field Museum uh, field guides. I also have the link for this at the end. And it just shows you some of the um, very common Chicago butterflies that rely on um, local natives. You know, the violet, the fritillary, violet fritillary uh, needs violets. The pearl crescent needs asters. Uh, Eastern comma, which is a kind of wonderful little uh, scraggly looking butterfly. It needs elms and nettles. Red Admiral needs nettles. Uh, spicebush swallowtail needs spicebush, which is not as common really, but we have sassafras trees, a few of them around. So uh, it's important to have native plants and to, and to look for uh, providing host plants in your gardens. Uh, butterflies and, and a lot of insects are much less discriminating in terms of nectar. They, they will go to a variety of plants for nectar and uh, many people you know, know that uh, they like zinnias and those are non-native, but, um, but for the most part, it's best to focus in my mind on, on uh, native plants. To feed birds, we really have to encourage insects. 96% 90 of land nestlings, so no ducks, but I mean, land nestlings eat insects and they especially they need caterpillars. For a clutch of uh, chickadees to be raised, it takes six to 9,000 caterpillars. So uh, we really have to uh, boost our, um, our number of uh, insects that we're tolerating. This little uh, strange looking caterpillar fell on my glove and it's a, a morning glory prominent, which I think it has a cool body and a cool name. So I put him on there. Um, I, I want to mention uh, there is a an expert who's an entomologist, uh, Doug Tallamy from the University of Delaware, 
who has looked at species, uh, US native species and also some non-native species in the United States and looked at uh, how many varieties of caterpillars each supports. And the idea is if a, an oak supports almost 500, well, this is, this is actually the numbers here are uh, native oaks in Illinois and this Illinois caterpillar species. In the United States, native oaks support more than 500 species of caterpillars. And why that's important uh, is that caterpillars are really a measure of wildlife value. What eats caterpillars? Well, other insects, birds, fish, reptiles, amphibians, mammals, you know, chipmunks and skunks, lots of things eat caterpillars. So caterpillars are really a measure of wildlife value. This chart is showing you that among herbaceous plants, the column on the left shows you that goldenrods and asters are really top of the list for supporting um, uh, caterpillars. Goldenrods support 112 Illinois species of caterpillar, asters 107 and wild strawberries, these are native strawberries. These are all native, referring to native plants, 64 species of, of caterpillars. And on the right side, native oaks, cherries, willows, birches, you know, top the list. I have the full list, the link to the full list at the back of the uh, presentation if people wanna look through. And in terms of avoiding uh, pesticides and lawn chemicals, I mean, uh, apart from the idea that uh, we wanna kind of reduce the toxins in our soil, in our, well, in our soil and also in our yards, uh, there's a couple of things I wanna call out. The most common insecticide in the United States are, states are neonicotinoids, the bottom of this list here. Neonicotinoids are commonly, uh, coat, seeds are coated with them, nurseries are um, use them uh, on, especially on cultivars and non-native plants. That's really where you should, uh, if, you're, if you're shopping for non-natives, ask about neonicotinoids. Most recently, for example, I, I as uh, Natural Habitat was helping the city uh, for the, our tree fund to purchase 31 elm trees. And the city was just about to purchase and it turned out, I, I just asked about neonicotinoids in these elms and the nursery was gonna do a soil drench of neonicotinoids on all, that's what it does for all of its trees, which makes that tree poisonous to insects and birds for three to six years at a minimum actually. Um, so, uh, because three to six applied to rhododendron and a tree may have uh, taken much more insecticide. So, um, uh, in any case, neonicotinoids are uh, a systemic toxin that spreads not only to foliage, nectar, pollen, whatever the plant has, uh, the full plant, it also um, uh, can spread to soil and water. So. This is a photo of um, Lovelace Park where the city has agreed to reduce its mowing. Um, mow less, you know, what do we mean by mow less? We mean, you know, add a shrub, you know, reduce the size of your lawn, add a wildflower um, area, something like that. Or you can add um, uh, you know, no mow grass options. Those are mostly non-native, but there are uh, native options as well. In my front yard, I just took out non-native grass and I have buffalo grass and Pennsylvania sedge going there, which are basically four, four inches or so. Uh, Pennsylvania sedge is taller, maybe six inches, but uh, going in the front yard. So there are options if you, if you want to uh, reduce your lawn. At Lovelace Park, we uh, did a little effort to have everyone tell the city how beautiful it looked unmowed because they're very worried about leaving something unmowed. So we had everyone text into 311 to tell them it was beautiful. Leaving the leaves and plant stalks. Uh, most of our uh, people know that uh, monarchs migrate down to Mexico in wintertime, or, or most of them do. They There are different uh, paths that some of these monarchs are on. But uh, most insects overwinter right in our backyard. Some of them overwinter right at the bottom of our favorite plants. You know, uh, he, here uh, are some of the plant, uh, some of the insects that are in the leaves overwintering. Queen bumblebees, queen bees over overwinter, fireflies. These are all in the leaves. The woolly bear that you know signals autumn overwinters in our leaves. So we really want people to leave the leaves. Don't mulch them. Some of the um, insects are. Uh, 
you know, overwintering as adults, as cocoons, as uh, eggs, and mulching really just shreds whatever we have saved from uh, being hauled away. So we we want we want our leaves. It's also a natural fertilizer. Um, and in addition, and I, I should mention as well that uh, piling your leaves around it is important to uh, leave a space around tree trunks so that there isn't rot or uh, you know like three inches around tree trunks. So leave a little air for your trees, but basically leave your trees in your uh, flower beds. Uh, it will, if there's too much, if there are too much, too many leaves on grass, it will kill your grass. Uh, 30 per, it, grass can apparently generally take 30% coverage with leaves, but you know, it's very easy to rake leaves into flower beds under trees um, and, and shrubs. These are critters that are in on our plant stalks. Uh, you know, any mantis, uh, walking sticks, um, a bunch of cocoons. Uh, there also are gall flies on, on goldenrods that are maybe familiar to many people. The luna moth in the lower left is one of our most beautiful moths. It's a very large moth. And you can see that it's cocoon there in, in brown, looks just like leaves. You wouldn't necessarily notice it on a plant. You might see it on a plant stalk, but it looks like a leaf curl on a plant stalk and it can easily fall so um, and be in your leaf litter. So that's the end of this slideshow that I have. I, I just want to mention this was my yard. Uh, how do you get started? Well, what I did is right now, you can even with the snow around, you know, save all your packages. People are <laughs> shopping and waiting at home for their shopping. So save all your boxes. And uh, when it gets to be a little warmer and you can stand to be outside and work in your garden, you can lay your uh, cardboard down, cover it with compost and mulch, seed on top, wait a little while to do um, plugs or to plant because you want to keep the, uh, the, the point of the cardboard, which can also be used with, with uh, layers of uh, newspaper. Um, but, you know, the point of having a layer down that's cardboard or newspaper is to smother the underlying grass. And so that's what I did. And you can see that the, um, in the lower right, the grass that is that little, we made a, just a little uh, pathway of grass so that people can cut across from the sidewalk to the cars. And you can, that's buffalo grass. It's, it's really not um, very bothersome, I would say, you know, in terms of just letting it go to seed and, and be four inches tall. That's, I mean, I think that's, nobody has complained whatsoever about that. Leslie, Leslie, yeah. this is far butts. There's a question on whether that cardboard goes directly over the grass. Yes, it goes directly over the grass. You should take off the, any tape or any plastic that's on there. Um, that will not disintegrate. Uh, but to be honest, I, I peeled it up. I got to say, I didn't get all of the uh, tape off and I peeled it la up later. But that uh, basically you leave the cardboard straight down and it will disintegrate and you just uh, your garden just starts. So this is the same space. The lower right is the same space uh, that I have covered with cardboard. And then the rest of this, I'm not going to go through. These are just ways to be involved. It's kind of an appendix to the um, slideshow. Um, ways to spread the word about what you're trying to do and also have your uh, neighbors understand what you have uh, going on. On the left, you know, we, we ended up getting nas uh, National Wildlife Community Wildlife Habitat certification for Evanston. So uh, we got, you know, 200 homes to certify their yards and uh, got Evanston as a city to pay a little attention to that. On the right are steps that we're trying to encourage uh, people to take. But this is basically a, a petition, the, the pledge to protect pollinators and birds. We're really trying to show yard companies in the city that uh, we, people care about taking these more environmental steps. And uh, so showing that there's a market for that. So that it's free to sign a petition about that. And there are yard signs, it's to, which are $10 each, but just to cover our costs, but you don't have to do the yard sign. Um, these are plant, these are nurseries that do not uh, that sell native plants with no neonicotinoids. Here's some plant suggestions uh, for year round uh, forage for birds and insects, because you want to start off the spring early, especially for the rusty patch bumblebee, which is uh, uh, the endangered bee that's uh, um, kind of up early in spring. And then you want to carry it through to nuts and berries in wintertime for, for birds as well. And these are more suggestions of plants. 
This is uh, resources for, for uh, selecting your plants. And these are more my sources. So that's, and our next talk is uh, tomorrow night, actually, on, on trees and shrubs. And Allison, who I saw is in our group here, is, is giving that tomorrow. So that's the end of that. Thank you, Leslie. Let me just say that the slides from tonight's presentation will be on the League of Women Voters website probably tomorrow. So you don't have to copy everything down right now. You can look at the website tomorrow if you want to. I'll just take it back to the beginning. <clears throat> so that's, are there questions or should I just take this down now? Yeah. Hello? Yes. This is Barb again. Before other questions even come in, I thought of a couple. And that is if you're putting an in-ground garden in number one, um, what kind of soil amendments, if any, would you use? That's my question. Would you, would you use any mulch? Yeah, well, what so, I did, yeah, what I did, I, I think, uh, you know, generally it's, you know, helpful to plant in, in compost or, or in, um, I, what I did is a mix of mulch and compost, actually. I got two piles delivered to my front yard and I used it on, um, on all my grass. I put down the um, cardboard and newspaper. I ran out of cardboard. I didn't have enough to cover my whole front uh, parkway. And, um, and, then I, and then at four to six inches, four to six inches of, uh, and when you put down four to six inches of maybe mixed compost and, and mulch, you can seed right then. I mean, so if you start this in, you know, early in, in March or April with seeds, um, you, you know, it, it, things can get going pretty well in, in a few months. It, it took about two and a half months for the cardboard to deteriorate so that I could plant, um, dig in and plant cone flowers and some other things there. So um, you don't want to make too many holes in your cardboard because it'll encourage the grass to come back out. And personally, I have mile a minute vine in my front yard and I did not want it coming back. And um, so, yeah. And there's a question about uh, what should I plant in a shady spot that almost nothing seems to do well in? So maybe we should know why nothing does well, but, <laughs> but uh, shady spots. So, so pencil, if you want a grass look, looking like things, Pennsylvania sedge will take shade. Um, but the other things that take shade, you know, ferns, uh, lady, lady fern is a very common fern, but also Virginia bluebells. Um, while ginger does well, there are lots of there are lots of plants that do well in shade that are native plants. Um, yeah, strawberries can go in shade. Uh, so, but if it's salt, if it's salt that's causing it to not really uh, work there, or maybe there's just not that much soil under a tree, sometimes it's uh, then you, then you might need to add um, some compost or some mulch or something around that to, to get it going again. But again, don't put it against any trees. Leave three inches around your trees so they don't just rot. And what kind of mulch? Because you, you know you can get uh, free mulch from the city, which is basically ground up trees. But I assume that that isn't the best to use. Well, you I I think you know you can I, the the. Um, the, I think the reason not to use it is for vegetable gardening. You know, if you are, you know, but for the most part, uh, you know, I don't really think there's necessarily a big problem with that for, um, if, you know, th there may be, um, you know, metals or things that are in there that you do not, you for sure do not want to have in a vegetable garden. But to be honest, I'm not sure that it's so bad. And I, I, I just think it's so important to make this affordable for everyone so that to the extent you can um, use free mulch, you know, that's fine. I, I mean, um, I got a delivery and I, uh, from one of the uh, yard companies actually, which I don't know that that was any better than the city's mulch to be really honest about it. Leaf mulch is pretty good, you know, unbeatable. And somebody suggested using black plastic instead you can't of- do that. You can do that. So then you have plastic there underneath your plants. That's the problem with that, I think. I mean, you can definitely, it definitely works to smother it and you can, um, it, it's, you know, solar heats uh, the, the plants underneath. So it may, so what you could do is uh, put black, you know, the plastic down, kill the grass and then take it off. Um, the cardboard is, is uh, desirable because you don't have to remove it. You know, it basically you just plant right on top of it. 
but yes, you can certainly do uh, plastic smothering with plastic. And the other thing is, I don't want to encourage that personally because we have so much plastic in the world. Um, you know, so so that's where I I am on that. Can you uh, can you comment on light pollution? I can comment on light pollution. Yes, <laughs> like so, light pollution is really wasted light. Um, uh, so. Uh, what are the issues? Why, why should we be concerned about light pollution? We should be concerned about light pollution because white lights tend to attract moths and uh, they, they disorient birds. Um, the problem with uh, attracting a lot of insects to your lights is it makes it, a, um, they're much more susceptible to predation because what uh, you can create your own little uh, feeding frenzy here, you know, where you'll have spiders hanging out, you create an unnatural uh, death of moths and other insects from lights um, uh, because, the, because all other critters know where to go to get their dinner. So uh, that uh, there have been studies that lights contribute to the decline of uh, insects. They also disorient uh, birds so that uh, in, in not so much at our houses, but it could be at our houses. Birds tend to hit more windows because they're disoriented and it affects the repertoire uh, the reproductive um, success of birds. So, um, and in addition to that, humans don't sleep as well uh, with lights. So what's the answer to that? All we're talking about is wasted light. The things to do are to put shades on your lights, to use an amber light, uh, which does not attract insects as much and does not as much disorient birds, use uh, motion detectors, uh, avoid uh, attracting moths, and then just turn off non-essential lights. It's not saying you can't use any lights, but reduce the glare and direct it where you want it to be. Okay, here's a specific one. Uh, someone that ordered aspens from ETHS to be planted yeah. in April. Any tips on how they will impact our garden or yard? Uh, well, so I'm not an expert at this. Al Allison, can you say something about aspens? I, I know that there's a, a, a little bit of a discussion about the tree plantish effort at, at ETHS and aspens. And um, I don't know if Allison is listening. I, you know what I should do? I, I'm not an expert on aspens. I know there is a question about it and maybe I could follow up with that person if they could put, give me their um, email or something. My email is habitat at naturalhabitatevanston.org. Um, so maybe they could email me about that and I'll get the right answer instead of fumbling around. Okay, here's a really interesting one. I'm going to put in a colossal pollinator set of 150 plugs from Prairie Moon and what is currently lawn. I was thinking about rototilling the lawn before I plant the plugs. Is that a bad idea? It's not really a bad idea, but it's not the most carbon neutral idea. <clears throat> rototilling the lawn stirs up and, and uh, causes things to um, release more um, carbon and methane from whatever has been stored in the lawn. So no, it's, it's fine to do that. I also think it's a little more labor intensive to be honest, but maybe not, you know, um, I'm, I, I, you know, I wouldn't say no to whatever you, you feel is gonna get you going on it, you know? Um, so uh, the, the biggest thing is just deciding to do it. So, yeah. Well, how about tips on milkweed planting? So milkweed is hard to start, in my experience, okay, in my experience, uh, milkweed is sometimes hard to start from seed. Uh, I also generally, I, um, I, I mean, I do have common milkweed in my backyard, but I, I do, uh, there are milkweeds that are not as aggressive and that are shorter than common milkweed. Um, world milkweed, spider milkweed, um, even some of the, uh, and butterfly weed are the three shorter milkweeds that are easily available on, at nurseries. Um, I do think they're hard to start from seed, honestly, for some reason, or maybe it just takes one or to two winters to get them going. Um, but uh, they are available in plugs from Prairie Moon and Prairie Nursery. And uh, then the taller ones that are not as aggressive are Sullivan's and um, swamp milkweed and rose milkweed are, are not as aggressive, but still, they definitely spread and they're definitely five feet tall. So, you know, yes. I, I start milkweeds by having them um, in the ground uh, and wet over the winter. And the ones I have are the common milkweed, but it takes a couple of years for them to get started when you plant yeah. seeds. 
Yeah, that was my experience too. Yeah. Okay, and here's a question for somebody new to all of this. How does she find a consultant or a service to help? So there are, um, are well, there, there probably, there are definitely people who know a lot about native plants. Um, and, uh, you know, I can, I can, you know, give, give you a list of that. Maybe you could email me and I could share that out. Um, but uh, yeah, there, there are designers who can help with this. I, I um, yeah. So I'd, I'd be happy to, to sort of understand your needs and, and, and share that out. All right, and here's one of a more political small p nature. It says, how about the league advocates for a stronger regulation of leaf blower? She says, I'm pretty sure it's a nonpartisan issue. Wait, say that one more time. <laughs> how about the league advocate? Uh, oh, advocating. For use, advocate for the use of uh, leaf blowers, control the use. Yeah, you know, there is, uh, I also, there's a group of people who um, I help gather together who are, you know, want change to the leaf blower regulations. And there is beginning to be some discussion of um, changing the leaf blower regulations. For example, right now, it only prohibits uh, gas powered uh, leaf blowers uh, during parts of the year. And one thought that recently has come up from three of the aldermen is why, you know, if the issue is noise, why do we care whether it's, you know, how it's powered? Uh, so maybe the prohibition should be just, you know, only allow leaf blowers at certain times of the year, and you could even um, reduce the uh, reduce the time of the year. For me, as natural habitat, any leaf blower is bad. Is bad. Basically, you know what? It's blasting insects. It kills insects. We're not, you know, the speeds are up to two hundred miles per hour for the, um, you know, that the leaf blower is blasting insects. So in reality, we should be raking if we're trying to, you know, if we're trying to create habitat. Um, and you know, our yard is not that big. I really have not had any issue with just yet raking off, um, you know, leaves from the, our, our few little, you know, grass areas. So there's that. But I do understand the efficiency that, you know, for people who um, have larger properties, they, um, they, they, you know, the mow and blow guys kind of come through. Uh, so I, there's lots of uh, discussion about. Um, you know, changing the ban in, in Evanston. And yes, there are communities that have banned leaf blowers. Um, I know, and a lot of more are working on it right now. Rochester, New York has reached out to us to ask more about our leaf ban. The, the issue with Evanston's leaf ban is that the health department doesn't consider propane gas powered leaf blowers to be gas powered, which I don't even understand because propane is a gas. I don't even understand why that's a carve out, but anyway. Um, that's just me. I don't know if I answered the question or not. Okay. And another one about why is the goal, okay, let me see this, for Evanston to be carbon neutral so far in the future? Uh, I guess because we don't think we can do it very quickly is the answer to that. I don't know. But I want to back up because I did see uh, just on the uh, different companies that might be able to help uh, as consultants. And somebody mentioned the Spirited Gardener, which is Julia Bunn. She definitely is one. Allison Sloan, who's on this also on this call, also is uh, starting up a native nursery in Evanston. Um, there also is, uh, uh, hmm, uh, Pat Bernard is another person who uh, uh, also does uh, designs. I'm probably forgetting people. This is why I don't want like to do this. Uh, but there are there are several of them, and that's why I kind of wanted to do it offline when I can get um, I don't leave somebody out here. Um, okay. And here's an interesting comment. Uh, someone just read Wormser's Lawn to Meadows, and he has a sample layout of plants that distributes them randomly across the plot. Your model group them together, which is better. Well, uh, a. Well, one of the projects we have going is the Rusty Patch Bumblebee. So we've looked into bumblebees. Rusty Patch Bumblebee definitely is more attracted to a mass planting of the species it's going for. And that has followed through for other bumblebee species that they do look for um, uh, 
they I'm distracted by the chat, sorry. They do look for mass plantings of their favorite plants. So you, you may have more success attracting um, pollinators with mass plantings than with sprinklings. But, you know, uh, it, I mean, in nature, the, it's fine to do sprinklings. I mean, you know, that's sort of how things start off in nature. But what happens is things recede. And so you do get groups even in nature, you know, groups of similar species. Uh, uh, in a meadow, for example. I, I mean, I know that because I actually have started up, I'm restoring uh, 21 acres down in Indiana and uh, the meadow restoration has, has developed so that they are creating mass plantings. Um, so I see somebody asking, I don't really know the uh, nature garden park. Oops, I'm, yeah. I, I'm missing uh, some of the, maybe you can tell me anything to answer. Oh, I think you got muted. Katie Grow Wildflower Farm is my new native plant nursery on Facebook so far. Hopefully we'll be at the Evanston Farmer's Market. Any comment? Well, that's Allison. She also leads Natural Habitat Evanston, so I can't comment. <laughs> she and I co-lead Natural Habitat Evanston together, but yes, she's starting her, her nursery. Um, yeah, yes, and you know, Here's one from Connie Carduck. Do you know about the natural garden or park that's been recently developed in Chicago Lincolnwood on the west side of Kedzie between Tui and Devon? Is that being I properly can... developed or has it been abandoned? I have no idea about that. I have no idea. Maybe if somebody else is uh, can comment on that, I don't know about that. Allison and I have gone looking at certain natural areas in Evanston and um, and, they're, and Evanston is doing that, Glenview is doing that. You know, we are trying to push the city to just leave certain areas unmowed if they don't have to be used for uh, picnic or sports fields or uh, picnic areas or playgrounds. And it just seems as if, you know, it, it's an easy way to reduce our carbon footprint is to reduce our mowing in, in some of our public spaces. So uh, we hope that that will carry the day. Um, you know, the, the main pushback is aesthetic. People are afraid that they'll get complaints. Yeah. Um, Liz Kinney is saying we should mention our very own Mary Jane Klein, who has her own business too. And the other question is whether the Chicago Botanic Garden is a good resource. Hmm. Okay, that's... Uh, well, first of all, Mary Jane, do you want to say something or should I... Uh... I'm, I'm not the only, I know I'm not the only expert. I mean, I'm not a necessarily an expert. I'm self-taught expert. Uh, but if anyone, if Mary Jane or others want to comment, that is great. And uh, Chicago Botanic Garden, I have not, I, I have um, questions about its approach toward natives. Um, so it is, uh, when I've discussed this with Chicago Botanic and I've had good discussions about it, their position has been, you know, we are here to display the variety of, um, uh, of um, plants, you know, globally actually. And so our mission is not to promote, um, you know, natives. Uh, and so that I don't think they do promote natives. I mean, I, I've, I've looked for different courses uh, there and, and failed to find something that I thought was really um, that helpful. So that's, sorry. I mean, I know, write to me. And, <laughs> Habitat, <laughs> naturalhabitat.org <laughs> they do have the prairie garden there they do have the prairie garden yes yeah. yes they do have the prairie garden and then they give courses but it's a little frustrating actually i said my email wrong it's uh habitat at naturalhabitatevanston.org i don't want to mislead you lurie garden does promote natives yes yeah and garfield park well, I think we've probably come to the end. And I thank you so much, Leslie. This has been really interesting. I hope we get some future gardens. I want to make sure everybody has Leslie's email before we leave so they can have any further questions. And as we said, the, the slides will be on the website. And I'll try to get the um, recording on the website also after, after the meeting. Yeah. Thank you all. Sure. Thank you. Thank you.